yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Don't keep it away from your beard like that. There you go. That should be good. Check, check, check. Okay, so let's start. It's 4 p.m. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Roger Melko. Roger um, received his PhD at the University of Santa Barbara. Uh, then he was a postdoc in Oak Ridge National Lab, and now he's a faculty in Waterloo. His position is shared also with Perimeter. Uh, Roger is one of the pioneers of using machine learning in condensed matter. And uh, today he'll tell us a lot about this fascinating and very rapidly developing subject. subject. So please welcome. Perfect. Roger. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is this, can you hear me in the back? Is this working? Yeah, everything's good? Thumbs up, okay. Uh, thanks, Andre. It's been a fun day here. It's my first time at Brown, and uh, it, it's, the weather's so nice in America. I, I, you know, I never want to leave. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a condensed matter theorist. Uh, I was sort of brought up in the tradition of high temperature superconductivity, spin liquids, quantum magnetism, things like that. I always emphasize sort of computational physics as a theoretical technique or computational methods. Uh, and so with the sort of recent excitement around deep learning, machine learning, and all that, we've adopted a lot of these tools into our condensed matter, quantum anybody uh, system toolbox. And so that's what I'll be talking about, machine learning and anybody problem. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge um, people in the larger group at uh, University in Waterloo and Perimeter that I work with. So Perimeter kind of has an AI lab now. The Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab, which if you write it down, spells pickle. So, <laughs> a, uh, you know, we're part of the Pickle Institute. And I also have affiliations with uh, various other uh, sort of uh, institutes. One that will come up um, in my talk is the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which is Jeff Hinton's institute in Toronto. But, so this topic, uh, this, this colloquium is about uh, the quantum many body problem, you know, complexity in quantum many body systems machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all these new ideas, which of course aren't new at all. And the first slide I want to uh, show you guys is just you know, uh, a slide that uh, gets to the point of that you know, as computers were being developed uh, you know, during and immediately after World War II, you know, these giants of the field like von Neumann and Turing were already thinking about ideas in, in, in AI uh, that are still relevant for today. So, of course, this is Turing, von Neumann, his wife and dog. This is the uh, IES machine that, that von Neumann was sort of uh, you know, f uh, a famous architect of. Uh, we still use von Neumann architectures in the machines that sit on our desk and are in our phone. Uh, you know, so there, there's this rapid advance of machines, uh, uh, sort of like hardware technology and theory after World War II. But Turing and von Neumann were both thinking of ideas that are relevant today in the modern sort of context of machine learning and neural networks. And in fact, Turing was, was uh, very bullish on, on the concept of sort of intelligence and learning. And he believed in the idea of you know, programming a machine uh, like a child, you know, starting it off in some sort of initial state, uh, and then teaching it with data so that it subsequently learns. Von Neumann, who is a, a brilliant you know, physicist, mathematician, who studied the idea of complexity, you know, we name entropies after him, he understood that certain problems and tasks were very difficult and complex, and he made the observation that sort of natural uh, organis uh, you know, natural organisms uh, really battle these ideas of complexity naturally. So if we pattern match, you know, we we grew, you know we evolve on the savanna. We are used to seeing predators, whatever bears, I don't know, whatever predator predators live on a savanna, tiger, I don't. Know. Uh, you know, our brains were adapted at sort of picking out motion, looking at patterns. So even though there's complex, you know, image processing issues, uh, he believed that by modeling, you know, these computers after natural processes in our brain, we would have some sort of uh, ability to maybe battle this complexity. So these two ideas, you know, learning and neural networks, if you will, uh, kind of still form uh, some of the mo uh, most fundamental sort of bases of our modern technology. So Turing, uh, you know, can be largely credited with, um, you, know, sp you know, sparking the uh, ideas of artificial intelligence in, in the consciousness of, of, of society. And uh, this slide, although it's not, this isn't a physics graph, even though this is a physics colloquium, this is kind of a social graph. 
is meant to illustrate uh, the subsequent you know, AI booms and busts, or what you know, the AI booms and the AI winters we sometimes call that followed. Uh, so this is you know, very sort of generally uh, a graph of interest or funding or something like that. You know, how many people are working in this field? How, is the, how much money is flowing into the field? And the idea is that uh, Alan Turing really started interest in the field initially with a letter to the London Times, which you can read online, which he uh, you know, basically outlined the idea that you know, these early machines that we had built, or that they had built, uh, you know, could be used for so much more uh, than you know, uh, breaking the Enigma code or whatever it was that people were using these machines for. Uh, and he really sparked a lot of interest in the idea of sort of a general artificial intelligence, the idea that uh, computers could be substitutes for human brains and many, uh, uh, many thought processes, if you will. Uh, there was workshops uh, in the late 50s as sort of a lull. Uh, again, this is not a very scientific graph. Uh, but at some point in, I guess, the early 60s, there was essentially like an uh, ARPA program in the US, which increased funding until, you know, and we can all sympathize, there was a bad referee report on the progress of the field. And so this Light Heel report started one of the first big AI winters. So artificial intelligence research fell out of fashion, right, until uh, what they call the fifth generation, which was essentially a lot of the Japanese researchers picking up artificial intelligence. Uh, in the mid-90s, for now we're getting into the realm of where many of us remember uh, the ideas of neural networks and so on in the literature. Uh, starting in the mid-90s was another AI winter. Funding was basically slowing down. Um, you know, the idea of publishing papers on neural networks, none of us would have done it in the, in the sort of uh, mid to late 90s. And there was an uptick because of the sort of dot-com era, the dot-com bubble burst. There was another a lull, another small winter. Uh, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, I got to plug Canada since I'm you know, from Canada. Uh, really started a funding program during this next winter. And I would argue that the CIFAR program uh, seeded the next rise on this graph, which, you know, this paper I got this out of was published in 2009. So what the author missed was obviously this part of the, the graph. Whereas in, I just added that myself. Um, <laughs> you know, starting in 2012, there's been this explosion of interest in artificial intelligence, deep neural networks, machine learning, and all sorts of uh, topics along this line. So now we're, now the question is how high does this, this line go? And I will leave that for a future talk. But there, has, there have been booms and busts in the AI cycle. What happened in 2012? And again, maybe you could trace it back to some funding programs in 2004, 2005. And I think um, the, the recognition of the current boom cycle, if you will, uh, was laid out nicely in the, uh, the recent Turing Award. So are any of you in, in computer science and CS? No. OK, great. No, just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> CS doesn't have a Nobel Prize, but the Turing Award is the Nobel Prize in many senses in CS. It's their highest honor. Okay? So this year's Turing Prize, aptly named for Alan Turing, of course, went to these three individuals, uh, Jeff Hinton, Joshua Bengio, and Yann LeCun. Uh, and the citation is, you know, they ushered in major breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of, I guess, uh, details that are hidden behind that citation. Uh, but really, the, these three um, gentlemen, who were all part of this CIFAR program, by the way, if we're talking about Canada, I don't know why. Uh, Jeff Hinton is at the University of Toronto. Yann LeCun was his postdoc. He's now in New York, where I'm spending my sabbatical uh, at NYU and head of Facebook. Uh, so you can imagine that job. He's the head of AI research at Facebook, right? It's a fairly uh, complex position. And Yoshua Benjo, who's now at University of Montreal running a very large sort of academic machine learning program. Uh, these three guys, you know, plowed through the AI winters uh, and, you know, kept their focus on uh, all sorts of technology like neural networks uh, and things that uh, basically paid off in the long run. 2012 is a special time in this boom-bust cycle because of the boom that happened and has largely to do with uh, Jeff Hinton's uh, paper, uh, which is dubbed AlexNet now, which is uh, a paper that was, uh, was introduced a classifier uh, uh, for a machine vision task. So in computer science and in machine learning research, uh, 
there's standard data sets that people work on. So these, I'll show you examples of these data sets. Uh, but for example, one of these data sets called uh, ImageNet is pictures of things like koalas, tigers, whatever these pictures are, with labels associated with them. And you know, I don't know if this is true, the Olympics of computer vision, but during a conference where uh, uh, you know, people race their different artificial intelligence models for classification of these images, there's a large uh, astounding breakthrough that happened basically in 2012. And that's when sort of a deep convolutional neural network that's laid out in this paper uh, beat all other uh, you know, benchmarks uh, by, a, by a large degree. So you can, you can look into this paper, you can see the benchmarks. You can see a huge jump in the technology of classifying these images. And I'll get into it, but basically the task is you know, taking all the pixels of this image, you know, the, the color, color pixels or grayscale pixels in some standard data sets, and successively saying, yeah, this is a wombat, you know, this is a tiger, this is whatever, you know, a television, I don't know what this is supposed to be. This is a, this is a traditionally difficult data set that, you know, uh, has sort of a ground truth dictated by how humans would classify this data. And so 2012 really marked uh, the point where machines began to equal humans in this task. And, and we've just accelerated from there. It's interesting to note that this paper now has, I just checked this this morning, over 48,000 citations. You know, that's since 2012. You know, I think as physicists, we would be happy to get even a fraction of those citations. Well, I think the point of looking at the citations for this paper is really that, uh, you know, these, these sort of advances in deep convolutional neural networks and other types of machine learning algorithm really are influencing the world. They're really changing the world in a very striking way that we see every day. You know? So we hope as physicists that we drive technology and we drive thought and, and, and so on. Uh, but I would argue that artificial intelligence research since sort of the early 2010s has really driven a lot of uh, technology uh, and I guess you know, dreaming in the world. <clears throat> I've been throwing around all sorts of lingo now, all sorts of jargon. So I just want to come back and, and maybe uh, uh, address uh, sort of the hierarchy or the, what I perceive as the hierarchy of structure in some of these uh, um, uh, words that I've been using. So artificial intelligence, AI winters, AI, as you can imagine, is just sort of the general concept of a thinking computer. Uh, people talk about um, <clears throat> a, you know, general AI or some sort of AI that mimics a human mind. You can imagine a conscious robot, the Terminator, whatever. All the, you know, these things fall within artificial intelligence, sort of the word. But within that concept of, of, of general AI or artificial intelligence in general, you know, lies subsets of machine algorithms, right? So algorithms that, that do different things, like for example, process data, um, or you know, uh, take input from the world and perform actions, like, uh, like a self-driving car might. And so I'm gonna talk about a subset of artificial intelligence research that we call machine learning, which is, again, back to Turing's original idea, the concept that you know, we change the program of a machine based on the data that it's exposed to, just like a child's programming is changed by his exposure to the, the world when he's young or when he's old, I guess. Neural networks are a subset of machine learning algorithms, so not all machine learning is neural networks, but neural networks are a very powerful subset of machine learning algorithms uh, that are responsible for all these astounding uh, advances like happened in 2012 with machine vision and so on. And deep learning, which I'll define sort of briefly, is a sort of subset of neural network research. So deep learning in its simplest incarnation is just sort of stacked uh, neural networks. <clears throat> so because we're essentially all in physics, is that right? Maybe some of us in engineering. Uh, I, I want to sort of think of uh, the idea of machine learning and neural networks in the context of some problems uh, that we would encounter in physics and specifically in many body uh, physics. So if you're an experimentalist and even if you're a theorist, you're probably exposed to data quite a bit. So if you're an experimentalist, that's easy to imagine. Uh, you might have neutron scattering data. Uh, you can have you know, STM images. Uh, you can have cold atoms trapped in a, uh, interacting laser beams that fluoresce and give you, you know, single site resolution of the atoms. Uh, I can even imagine if I was a computational physicist, which I am, 
I can produce simulation data, so I might have a path integral Monte Carlo method, I might have a classical Monte Carlo, molecular dynamics. You know, all of these methods that we're uh, used to experimentally and computationally produce data sets. And what machine learning is, very generally, is the idea that we want to process this data, learn from the patterns in the data, and, and change our processing or change our programming based on the exposure to the data. So instead of explicitly designing algorithms, like I want to find an algorithm that looks at a neutron scattering uh, plot and picks out the Q vector for the Bragg peaks, okay? Uh, instead of programming that Q vector explicitly into the computer, I'm going to devise a way of uh, changing that programming based on the amount of data that's being sent into the computer. So maybe some way of systematically searching based on exposure to data. So this is kind of the ability to learn and change uh, which underlies machine learning. In machine learning as approached by computer scientists, uh, there's often three subsets of algorithms, or actually they're more like tasks uh, that machine learning program, uh, uh, programs undertake. So I'll talk about the first two. The first one is supervised learning. Supervised learning is the idea that I'm going to take a bunch of data, just like that ImageNet data, pictures of you know, a tiger or some guy's face under a seat belt, and I'm going to classify that data with labels, like tiger's a label, right? You know, drunk kid under a seat belt's a label. And the, uh, the whole goal of supervised learning is to, is to somehow encapsulate that function that takes all of those pixels in that image and translates them into that label. Supervised learning, it's supervised because I train on a data set that already has the labels identified, you know, typically by a human who looks at those pictures. <clears throat> Unsupervised learning. The vast majority of data that exists on the internet and elsewhere is not labeled a priori, right? So you have videos and images and, all, and so on um, out, there in the, out there in the world, and you want to somehow, you know, identify or cluster maybe groups of, of like images together or learn the underlying rule that, by which those images are produced. So for example, I'm not on Facebook, but Facebook, you know, in principle you can, as far as I understand, uh, label, label people's uh, images or tag people's images, right? So those tags are, are labels and, and they're used for supervised learning. So Facebook runs a very large supervised learning algorithm whereby when you tag your friends and family, uh, that algorithm slowly learns to identify uh, other images that are untagged and it can apply those tags or labels. So that's supervised learning. Um, if you look at your iPhone and you have pictures on your iPhone, you'll notice that your iPhone will cluster your images into people. So, you know, me, whatever, my dog, my wife, my son, I don't know. So this, there's no labels attached to those images, but the computer's naturally learned that okay, this image has me in it, or this image has my wife in it, or whatever, right? That's unsupervised learning. It's doing, a, it's doing the job of, of clustering or association, okay? So it's taking like images or images with the same person in them, and it's telling you, hey, there's something similar about these images. I believe there's the same person in these images, okay? So those are common applications of supervised and unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning also has uh, the goal, which you don't see on the surface, of learning the underlying distribution, which means that in principle, I can generate new images. So if I feed in a whole bunch of images of me, or a cat or a dog, into an unsupervised learning program, it can produce new images of that cat or that dog that haven't been seen before. So if you look at some of these general um, um, GANs, these adversarial networks, uh, that you know, people feed in all of these images of celebrities and then it produces new, uh, you know, pictures of celebrities that don't exist in the wild. Uh, this is an example of generative modeling, okay. The third type of machine learning, which I won't talk about too much, is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning doesn't assume an underlying data set, like images or videos, uh, but it's the technology that uh, underlies things like self-driving cars. So in, in Reinforcement learning, you typically have cameras set up or you have GPS coordinates like in a, you know, data that's streaming in. And uh, they, what you're doing is you're training what's called an agent, think of like a robotic agent, to perform actions. So, you know, you have a state of your environment. I'm on the road driving. 
I'm between the white lines, there's a car here, there's a car here. What should the action be on the steering wheel or the gas pedal? So that's, that's the sort of uh, the context of reinforcement learning, okay? So gameplay, alpha go, you know, beating, beating these highly complex games, uh, things like that. That's typically reinforcement learning where there's a state and what the program is doing is telling you an action to perform on that state to get a new state. So there's also applications of reinforcement learning in quantum antibody physics, but <coughs> I won't have time for that. So that was an overview. Let's look at a general, uh, let's look at a specific problem, sorry, uh, which is sort of the um, uh, Ising model of machine learning. So if you, if you go to, uh, I don't know, some Coursera course, or if you read Michael Nielsen's book, which I did, on uh, neural networks and deep learning, the first example for supervised learning that you will encounter is a so-called MNIST data set. MNIST, I don't know what M stands for, and I guess I should know what NIST stands for, National Institute of something. Uh, it's some American thing, I assume. Um, <coughs> MNIST is just the, the name of a data set which is handwritten uh, digits from zero to nine. And this data set, again, is a standard data set. There's 7,000 images in that data set. It was US Census Bureau employees and high school students that somebody commissioned years ago to write all these, these handwritten digits. Again, 70,000 of them. They're digitized, so there's 28 by 28 grayscale pixels, okay, so they're in, a, in an array, and they're labeled. So there's sort of prototypical standard uh, data set that you run your first machine learning program on. And the idea is you train, you wanna train a neural network or some sort of machine learning program to take in these pixel values and assign a label. That's a five, that's a zero, that's a four, and so on, okay? This is the technology that is used when bank machines read your checks, or when post offices sort your letters and so on. <clears throat> so I'm gonna jump right ahead and think of, is a condensed matter or a statistical uh, uh, physicist, a stat phys physicist, I might, I might make parallels between a 28 by 28, you know, two dimensional grid of handwritten, uh, you know, pixelized images to configurations that I would either pull from a Hilbert space or that I would draw from some state space of some, of some model like a 2D Ising model. So I'm gonna use the 2D Ising model as the physicist's MNIST uh, in terms of classification. And here I might wanna classify things like a ferromagnet, you know, which could have most spins up or most spins down, a paramagnet or a random state, and even something like a critical point. So I can imagine that if I can solve for the classification of uh, pixelated images that are handwritten, there should be no reason that I can't solve for the labels of these, these, you know, these, these images drawn from some physical uh, uh, state space. <clears throat> so the strategy is to devise a function, and that function is merely a map that takes me from 28 by 28, which I hope is 784, if I did that right, uh, of real numbers, which I guess could be between zero or one, or however uh, this grayscale uh, image is, is encoded. So it, it would take a vector that is that length and it would assign a label, uh, you know, which I've drawn from 10, ten say if you will, 10 uh, numbers, 10 integers, and, and associates uh, five handwritten with the label five. And the way we're gonna do that, although there's many, many strategies, is with a neural network. So a neural network is one algorithm uh, within this superset of, it's a subset of machine learning. Okay, so it's one type of very powerful algorithm. The idea is that there's a signal that, pros that, that propagates through a network. So each one of these circles is a function or a gate that takes, so for example, this, this vector is stripped apart, rasterized, one pixel's plugged in here, one pixel's plugged in here. This layer has 784 uh, nodes. Uh, those, the grayscale, you know, is zero to one. Uh, there's, there's basically functions that either let that signal propagate through or they stop them, these ones stop them. There's multiple layers, and I'll explain what these lines are. And then this output here, there should actually be 10 of these. You know, one of them fires for the label that you've associated with five, and all of the other nine should not fire. They should give you zero. So the idea of a neural network, the simplest neural network is, this, is just this idea that you feed forward 
uh, of these, this pixelated data through the network, and one of the output neurons fires. <clears throat> so we're going to construct this based starting with the activation functions. So what are all those lines and circles? The circles are just a function, and the simplest function uh, that's sort of commonly used uh, is a sigmoid function. So the input, let me imagine I'm on the first layer here. My n is go, uh, my x is the pixels. I, you can start imagining these things as being black and white if you want, binary or grayscale. They can be real numbers. 1 to 784. Uh, each one of these lines labels what I'm calling a weight, uh, which is associated with uh, this uh, function here. And here's one choice for this activation function, which acts like a neuron, which allows a signal to propagate through or not. It's called a sigmoid function, 1 plus e, you know, sum over all weights, x values, minus a bias. And a bias is just sort of telling you how much that neuron uh, matters. Okay? So fairly simple. The sigmoid output looks like this. It goes between 0, which means that signal's sort of stopped by that neuron, to 1, which means that signal's free to propagate. Uh, and a neural network is really just made up of a, a sort of collection of these sigmoids you know, with these weights. Uh, that let the signal propagate through. <clears throat> and so the first question people ask is why this functional form, you know, 0 to 1? Well, okay, I can could, I could see 0 to 1, but why this specific thing we call a sigmoid, 1 plus e to the, this thing here? Well, the answer is there's no reason. It's just something that people found works. And that's your first lesson as, you know, machine learning aficionados now is that lots of the structures of neural networks exist just because people found that they worked over the last couple decades, yeah, period. This thing is, you know, you can calculate the gradient, which I'll talk about. Uh, it, it, it doesn't vanish for uh, typical cases. It's well behaved. That's good enough. There's many different options. People use all sorts of things. Uh, the step function is an obvious one. Why not just have an output of a neuron either zero or, you know, exactly zero or exactly one? Well, it turns out there's problems with the gradient here. Uh, hyperbolic tangent, that's another good one people use. Why not? And this one here, which is just, you know, the activation function zero up to some point where it becomes linear, called a rectified linear unit, whatever. I mean, this thing is the best, you know, the current best state-of-the-art uh, activation function that people use. So again, it all has to do with, you know, the training uh, the ability to calculate gradients and, and sort of heuristic ideas or heuristic observations about why certain things work better than others. What I'm trying to do is motivate physicists with the idea that, you know, there could be a more firm theoretical grounding to this type of, uh, these types of structures, but we'll get back to that. So let me take all these uh, activation functions and put them together into something a little more well-defined. Uh, so here's what we call a single layer or a shallow feed-forward neural network. Okay, it's shallow because there's uh, only an input layer, which is the size of the uh, number of pixels in your image. Okay, so if it's 28 by 28, again, there's 784. They can be grayscale. Each one of these is a weight attached to an activation function. And there's a number of activation functions that make up this hidden or latent space, which you're free to vary. So I'm just going to call that number of hidden units. And then these are attached to another layer, which is the output layer of your neural network, which you know, either outputs, hopefully, you know, one for the uh, label that corresponds to the original image, um, and, and zero for all the other labels. So that's kind of the simplest feed-forward neural network. Uh, the structure only has one you know, adjustable parameter, you know, which is the number of hidden units. Uh, which we'll get back to. It kind of tells you how expressive this thing is. <clears throat> so that's enough to, enough to do image classification. Learning is the idea of adjusting the weights and biases. So where was I? When I was back here, these Ws and Bs, they have to be adjusted so that that function, which does the mapping that you're looking for, uh, is appropriate. It's doing the right job. So learning is simply the idea of, of defining an optimization problem so that you can adjust the weights and biases to give you the proper function to do this labeling. It's as simple as that. So how do you do this? Well, so the first thing you do when you're training these neural networks is, is to split uh, your, your data set into a training and a testing or training and a validation set. So typically MNIST is split up into 60,000 images that you use for training. 
you used to adjust the weights and biases, and then afterwards you take 10,000 of those and feed them through and just you know, uh, look at the accuracy of the neural network. This tells you whether or not you know, your neural network will work well on images it hasn't seen before. It's like the generalization ability or the absence of overfitting and things like that are, are uh, uh, <coughs> predicated on uh, the existence of this validation set. So that's it. You can do this uh, uh, you know, learning procedure. Basically what you do is you define a cost function. So a cost function is simply uh, you know, at, at the output layer, you're expected minus your actual. So if, if I'm expecting a five, but I, I fire neuron four, you know, that, that's labeled for four, then I'll have some sort of non-zero cost here. If, if, if I fire the right neuron for my, my uh, training set, then the cost for that uh, vector will be zero. So cost functions are another thing, just like the activation functions, which are kind of defined by the user. They're adjusted by the user. Uh, you're free to define different cost functions. Each cost function, what it does is it defines an op optimization landscape. And so what you're doing is when you start the learning procedure, many of us are used to optimization problems, you're starting out with some random weights and biases, and what you're doing is you're slowly falling down this like free energy funnel, if you will, into the minimal, you know, hopefully the global minimum of that cost function. So almost all machine learning uh, procedures are based on uh, some sort of optimization procedure like this. And how do you do optimization? I mean, as physicists, you know as well as anyone else, there's many different ways of doing it. The standard way of doing this in machine learning is through gradient descent. So you, you, you've defined the cost function, this, this free energy funnel, if we think about physics. Uh, and then what we do is we slowly move down into, towards the global minimum uh, by adjusting the weights and biases, which I'm going to call parameters, uh, you know, using gradient descent. So I need to calculate the gradient of the cost function. There's another free parameter uh, associated with, with uh, whatever, the Lagrange multiplier there. So that's learning. All it is, defining a cost function, that cost function gives me an optimization, uh, an optimization landscape. I define a procedure to find the minimum, period. Machine learning, done. So of course, it's, you know, the devil's in the details. Depending on your data set and what kind of neural network you're looking at, uh, you know, what kind of onsets you start with. Uh, there's all sorts of tricks that people have developed over the last you know, couple decades to make this learning procedure work, to make it fast, to handle big data, to generalize well, and so on. So a couple kind of basic tricks are, are the idea that the, the full gradient is difficult to calculate exactly. So people break the data set up into mini batches. So you might pull, you know, you have 60,000 images. So you pull out 10, you calculate an approximate gradient, you do the gradient descent. You pull out another 10, you do it again. Pull out another 10. When you've exhausted that 60,000 element data set, that's called one epoch of training, you throw all the data back into the box and do it again. So when people say they're training over multiple epochs with a mini batch size of 10, all you're doing is a very messy approximate gradient descent. And there's all sorts of theories about why that works well, why the noise in the gradient descent helps with these procedures. Uh, but again, there's not really a kind of firm underlying theory uh, for this type of uh, optimization. And you can tell now that as I've been talking for a while, uh, there's a lot of art in this, and the state of the art is really adjusting hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are things like the number of hidden units in that middle layer, or the, it's the learning rate, or it's the number of epochs or the mini batch size. And a machine learning engineer, if, if, that, if there is such a thing, will often take uh, some sort of model or some sort of neural network, take some data set and start to adjust hyperparameters as they feed in data, uh, hopefully to, to, to kind of like, you know, in, improve the learning procedure. So there's a lot of fiddling around with hyperparameters, which is like the worst part of the job, right? Anyway, so there's a lot of, again, a lot of art in the state of the art. There's also many different neural networks. There's deep neural networks and things that I'll talk about. But the best way to learn is not to listen to me talk, it's to try it yourself. And so at this point, I would encourage all of you to, to download TensorFlow or PyTorch uh, if you're interested in this. Look at the MNIST data set, train with 60,000 images, and then use 10,000 test images and 
and ask the neural network how many of those are classified in error, okay? That's called, okay, the error, I guess. And you know, if, if I do this with one layer feed forward neural network with about 100 hidden units, you'll get about a 2% error rate on the test set. State of the art, absolute state of the art, you know, 2012, 2013, you could have 48,000 citations if you did this, uh, would have something like 0.2% uh, error of that test set classified. Okay, and now you should be asking, well, does that make sense? You know, there's no real ground truth for, uh, for image, uh, handwritten images. And that's a good point. Many of these images in this data set, remember, it's high school kids, right? They're all on drugs. It's like the, the images are like, you know, nothing makes sense here, right? So these things will never be correctly classified. So in physics, we have the advantage that we have ground truths in our data set. And so we can actually benchmark, it, it doesn't exist, but in principle, we should be producing standard data sets that uh, help uh, benchmark uh, uh, machine learning. Just an idea of giving back to the machine learning community. So just quickly, the last thing I wanna say about supervised learning before I spend 10 minutes on unsupervised learning is the idea that we now replace MNIST with your favorite data set. And my favorite data set was always the Ising model, a two-dimensional Ising model. You know, I can produce a high-quality data set with classical Monte Carlo. There's a phase transition between a paramagnet and a ferromagnet. There's a critical point. I could feed in images above and below the transition. I could label high temperature, low, uh, low temperature, ah, high temperature, low temperature, vice versa. Same neural network, same thing I did with MNIST. I can ask it to classify. I can produce new images. I get you know, the output of the trained neural network looking something like this. Here is the neuron for the ferromagnet firing with one. I cross the phase transition. You know, here's the neural neuron for the warm. You know, it's red. It's the paramagnet neuron. That's the critical point. I can do finite size scaling. I can calculate critical exponents from the output of the neural network. I can model the neural network. So this one's explainable. I have microscopic, mo I, I have sort of like, uh, models of the weights and biases, which, which you know, give me the same output. And so as a physicist, when I have ground truth, I can, you know, I can not only uh, use a neural network to explore uh, sort of the efficiency of classification of things like this, but I can also turn this around and take our, you know, our standard uh, you know, um, concepts like order parameters, uh, yeah, phase transitions, and so on, and I can use these to design model neural networks that may tell me something about the machine learning procedure itself. So this supervised learning idea has, oops, sorry, has now taken off uh, in, the in the processing of experimental data, which was the original indication. So a couple of really nice examples are STM images of BISCO uh, that came from uh, Seamus Davis's group, so Una Kim and Frank Zhang. Uh, basically learn how to classify correlations of this data. You know, so even though I was telling you about a 2D Ising model, you know, in principle, once you understand the concept of an order parameter and, you know, different phases of matter and classification and so on, these neural networks are very powerful. You can have many different categories of correlation function or correlation or, or entanglement structure or whatever you want is the labels. And you can feed your data through these feed forward neural networks and have them automatically classified. So that's a really impressive work. Another one is categorizing theories for correlations, which came out of uh, Marcus Greiner's uh, Fermi Hubbard you know, experiments, where these are atoms trapped in optical lattices. And so they use uh, some fairly sophisticated you know, CNNs, these convolutional neural networks, to basically look at images producing, produced by their experiments, and they've classified uh, you know, different categories of correlation, or even different categories of theory, if you will. So this supervised learning paradigm, uh, I think, is, is sort of widely applicable to all sorts of uh, experimental data sets. And all you really have to know is the MNIST example and sort of the you know, slight, uh, slightly more sophisticated methods uh, that people use um, with these deep neural networks and convolutional neural networks. I'm gonna talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. Uh, so maybe this is a good point to ask if there's any questions on supervised learning and its application of physics. So just to understand clearly from your original, uh, so you started on three slides, you, you, were, you were just, you were classifying 
from your simulation of either a high temperature or low temperature regime uh, for the ice model, you would just how well were you able to look at that one image and classify it? Right. So this is trained with images, and the labels are, say, above the critical point or below, which I call paramagnet or ferromagnet. So once it's trained, you feed it new images, and this is the output of the new images. And this is saying that, like, this, this neuron fires when it's supposed to, when the images I've given it are in the right temperature regime, and this neuron fires when the images I've given it... You Right, yeah, so I've labeled the axis with temperatures because I a priori know the temperature, but the neural network only gets the raw pixels. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So this is a way of validating the fact that my neural network somehow generalized well. By the way, we only trained it on five temperatures, but then we give it data from all sorts of different temperatures. So this is the idea of generalization. It's the idea that, uh, you know, even though it hasn't seen 1.75, if I give it a configuration at 1.75 as a temperature, it classifies it correctly, right? So the idea is you can train these things on the extrema of phase diagrams, if you will, and they can fill in the middle of the phase diagram. So that's actually another common use for them, is to just you know, reduce the amount of overhead uh, in terms of uh, classifying and drawing out phase diagrams. I don't know, I must, I must be talking slow, so. Let me just quickly go through an uh, application of unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, attaching labels to raw data. Uh, unsupervised learning, there's, there's various unsupervised learning methods. I could take all of MNIST, throw it in without labels. The machine spits out clusters, says, look, there's nine of these, you know, 10 of these clusters, which, you know, you look at more closely, oh, these, those are all the uh, number of three, those are all the number five. And again, another unsupervised learning method is to take maybe one set of data, okay, so let me take all the twos out of MNIST, and let me train a neural network to learn the underlying probability distribution that represents a two, and then I can make new hideous twos uh, that can be generated by that neural network, right? So if you, I should have had the picture of a cat. So people have used these, they fed in a bunch of cats, and they've generated a new cat, and it's like a deformed demonic cat, you know, it comes out like whatever, that, that's generative modeling. This is very relevant for, for uh, you know, near-term quantum devices and experiments on quantum computers. So generative modeling, very simply, imagine now that I have an experimental device that's a black box and it's producing data. And I'm gonna think of, you know, a, a black box that has maybe Ising, an Ising system or a number of qubits I'm producing projective measurements that are either zeros or ones. So if I have 784, there's 784 elements in this vector, and downwards I can have as much data as I can fit into a machine. And what I want to do is I want to build a probabilistic model. So I'm going to use a probabilistic graphical model uh, to represent that target distribution. Okay? And so what I'm doing is I'm taking a neural network and I'm cutting off the output, and I want the rest of this neural network to represent a probability distribution. So it's, it's, a, it's a different setting. So interestingly enough, one of the sort of uh, versions of this neural network, which I'm calling a restricted Bolson machine, so this is like my neural network with that output cut off, uh, was invented by a physicist, John Hopfield, uh, who I just found out was Bert Halperin's advisor and Steve Gerben's advisor. So as a condensed matter theorist, we're proud of these models. Uh, Hinton really did the variation that we see here today, which is very similar to what I've been talking about. Uh, so again, the, the main difference is that this neural network, which again has weights and biases, isn't meant to be a, a classifier, but it's meant to represent a distribution. And the major change from the feed-forward neural network is the fact that these units are now binary units. They're not functions. They're just additional Ising spins. So I have Ising spins here, I have Ising spins here, I have weights, and I can define an energy, and all of a sudden this is an Ising model, and really big deal. I know that an Ising model can represent a probability distribution if I normalize it by a partition function, e to the minus e. So you can see I have weights, which connects visible and hidden, I have biases, which act like magnetic fields, and the point is that here's a neural network, I'm calling it a our restricted Bolson machine, but it's really just a stochastic neural network that represents a probability distribution. 
So what's the point of this in generative modeling? Well, the point is that I can uh, trace out the hidden units of that restricted Bolton machine and I have a parameterization with weights and biases of a distribution uh, that I want to un represent the underlying physical distribution that's living inside that black box, okay? So that's called the target P. If I look back at this slide, I have a black box distribution here that's unknown. And I, I can build a, a neural network such that if suitably marginalized, which means traced uh, out, out this latent space, uh, I can train this thing so that the parameterized distribution is very close to the target distribution. That's kind of the goal. So it's a different machine learning setting. It's a different optimization function. So the optimization function is now uh, minimizing the distance between the two distributions. So instead of a cross entropy or a, 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 a mean squared error, we typically look at what's called a kublak leibler divergence, uh, which is you know, P log P over the machine. And so when these things exactly lie on top of each other, it's a log of one. So I can define a cost function that goes to zero when I train my thing perfectly to represent the underlying data. And I won't get into details of training, but again, we do gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent on this cost function. <clears throat> uh, let me skip this. So what I can do with this trained machine is I can generate new hideous pictures of twos, but I can also, if I train it on Ising model data, I can produce new images of Ising configurations and I can calculate physical estimators like the energy, magnetization, and specific heat, okay? So that's what this is supposed to represent. I just have a joint distribution represented by the machine and I'm calculating an estimator. So maybe it's better to just show pictures of that. Here's a 2D Ising model where I've obtained uh, a data set on, an, I think it's an eight by eight system, so there's 64 Ising spins. And uh, using Monte Carlo, I've uh, uh, developed a, a data set as a function of temperature. Okay, and actually here's the energy and specific heat. Uh, it's hard to see, but the black, which is I can see here, is the exact value for the energy and specific heat obtained from the data set. Now what I've done is I've taken one of these generative models, these restricted Bolson machines, and I've trained uh, those machines on that data set, and then I've measured the, either the energy or specific heat from the machine itself. And what this is supposed to show you is that the quality of the machine depends on the number of hidden units. So that intermediate latent space, which in, in machine learning parlance affects the express, expressibility of the machine or expressivity, I don't know, whatever one of those is proper English, uh, uh, you know, matter. So if I only have four hidden units, I don't capture the, say, specific heat correctly. If I have 64 hidden units, then I start to capture the specific heat correctly. So you see the idea that you know, you're trying to parameterize a state uh, in, uh, into one of these neural networks and the size of the neural network matters. So a couple words on our current research along these lines. We're not really interested in classifying Ising model data. You know, we're interested in classifying the output of quantum experiments. So like neural network, uh, so, uh, you know, with neural networks, uh, we want to we want to uh, capture the wave functions of near-term quantum computers, and I'll show you a really interesting example. And I just want to make the caveat that you know wave function is not that different from a probability distribution, especially when there's no sign or phase. So if I restrict myself to systems that have simple wave functions that are all real and positive, then everything I just told you about learning you know restricted uh, Boltzmann machines for to classify probability distributions holds. Uh, so in principle, or in particular, let me say, if I have models that I know don't have what's called a sign problem, which means that if I have a Hamiltonian where the off-diagonal matrix elements are all negative, then I know that uh, the, by the parent frobenius theorem, the wave function is all real and positive, and I can train with, with data just in one basis. So here's a quantum model with uh, SZ and SX operators, I can train a restricted Boltzmann machine just from measurements in the Z basis. Uh, sorry, I forgot it was in America. Just in the Z basis. <laughs> so that Z basis data, I don't know, that Z basis data is informationally complete. And I won't go through this, but th what I do with a trained neural network is I produce estimators, just like the energy or the specific heat, but because I have full information about the wave function, I can also produce off-diagonal estimators like 
uh, sigma x, s, s, sx estimators, or entanglement entropies, and so on. So here's a real experiment that we applied this to. It's a Rydberg atom simulator that's in Misha Lukin's group at Harvard. So here's data sets. These are 51 atom uh, linear chains. They're Rydberg atoms, so what you see here is uh, you know, dots when the Rydberg atom's in its ground state, and I guess the absence of, of dots when it's in the excited state. They can produce all sorts of measurements of these uh, atom chains. They're like projective measurements, so just think of them as Ising variables. The Hamiltonian is known to, uh, with sufficient accuracy that we believe the wave function is real and positive. We can tune through phase transitions. And what we do with Misha Lukin's experiment is basically take the fluorescing output, the uh, ones and zeros that represent the Rydberg ground state or the excited state, the Rydberg atom excited state, and we feed these into our restricted Boltzmann machines. Those Boltzmann machines learn the complete wave function. And from those Boltzmann machines, after they're trained, we generate new instances, or as many as we want, of, of, of these projective measurements synthetically out of, out of the underlying distribution. And we measure things like, okay, the average value of sigma z, okay? ED means exact diagonalization. This is done on eight atoms, so not 51, but we did eight, so we can diagonalize it exactly. Here's the experimental magnetization, sigma z, and here's the reconstructed uh, restricted Boltzmann machine estimator from the neural network. That tells you it's working. What the sigma x here, which is off diagonal, okay, so this is a quantum machine, does, is we have the exact diagonalization of the model, so that's what we hope the experiment achieves, and this is the reconstruction from the data, which we see there's some sort of discrepancy. So it's these types of discrepancies in off diagonal estimators uh, that motivates us to do this, this work. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get more information out of these near-term quantum devices than we can get with the simple diagonal measurements. And here's another example of the entanglement entropy. So the entanglement entropy of different bipartitions of the Rydberg chain is typically a difficult thing to measure. Uh, so what we do is we train this restricted Boltzmann machine, and then we do a trick to measure the second Rennie entropy, which is common in uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo. And so we can see that we have expectations from the model through exact diagonalization, and then these diamonds are the reconstructed entanglement entropy that comes from the restricted Boltzmann machine. So they're based on the, uh, the generative neural network. And we can see there's discrepancies. And from these discrepancies, people, not me, I'm a theorist, experimentalists tweak the experiment and try to basically reconcile things like this. So this is the idea of, of sort of using these, these uh, neural networks as sort of ancillary you know, measurement enhancing apparatuses. And by the way, I'll just flash this up. This is how they used to measure the entanglement entropy before. Uh, which is this, again, I'm not an experimentalist, but it looks like a mess. So Rajul Islam, who's my colleague at Waterloo now, famously did this in 2015, this experiment to measure the entanglement entropy by physically replicating you know, this trapped ion system. Uh, now that's, that's an obsolete technology, because if we can learn the wave function in one of these neural networks, we can do these measurements uh, offline. So generative modeling. So we started simple, and I tried to give you a flavor for what we're doing now with unsupervised learning. Um, we can take unsupervised learning methods, these stochastic neural networks, and we can learn the wave function of near-term devices. Any quantum device, I believe, currently in existence, we can learn the wave function from. This neural network, which learns the wave function, is then used uh, to, you know, to enhance the hardware. It's like an AI assistant for the quantum hardware. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, we can also extend this to non-trivial quantum states that have an amplitude and phase. And we can also do kind of density matrix tomography with these types of methods uh, too, which I haven't shown you. So they're, they're very powerful. Um, sort of more generally, uh, why, you know, what are the interesting theoretical questions? Um, I think this idea of reconstructing quantum states in neural networks uh, brings up a question of sort of what wave functions are efficient for reconstruction. If you've heard of Google's quantum supremacy experiment that just came out last week, well, I have all that data. I can feed that data into this neural network, and I can ask, can my neural network you know, accurately reconstruct the wave function that's in Google's quantum device? And if so, is that device still quantum supreme? 
right? So you can ask these types of, of learning-based questions once you have access to the data. You can also ask, is that procedure of learning a wave function from data more or less complex than trying to learn the wave, ground state wave function given the Hamiltonian? Which is our usual setting. We usually have a Hamiltonian, I want to know the wave function. Now I have data, which has been prepared by a black box, and I want to learn that data, uh, it, you know, a representation of the wave function from that data. Are the, you know, are the, the cost functions in the same complexity class, or is one glassy and one's not glassy? And this gets to the whole point of why are we building quantum simulators? If I build a simulator for the uh, two-dimensional Hubbard model, like Marcus Greiner has, you know, can I take that data and can I, you know, can I leverage that data that's produced in the experiment with these types of sort of artificial intelligence enhancements to solve some of the most pressing questions in physics, like what are, you know, what is the mechanism behind, behind high temperature superconductivity? And I think things like this are sort of the ultimate goal. All right, sorry for going along. Uh, thanks for your attention. Dips in what, sorry? Oh, here? No, this is just something I, I ripped off the internet. There's no, no. <laughs> no, so for a glassy system, you expect there to be many local minima that are all of almost the same energy as the global minima. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's probably the biggest problem with these types of optimization procedures, is they tend to fall into one minima and then can't get over the energy barrier, you know, in, to explore all the all the adjacent minima. So neural networks, would not be able to that. yeah, there's no magic in them. So a, a neural network, you know, in, has a has a cost function, and the, for different types of neural networks and different, uh, co you know, cost functions. Uh, you know, like different definitions of KL divergences or whatever, these things look very different. So there's no, you don't have any a priori reason to think that, you know, machine learning would solve a, a, a difficult optimization problem when otherwise it's difficult, yeah. So what machine learning typically does is map one optimization problem to another, and unless there's something magical in that mapping, which takes something that has a lot of minima and smooths it out, which often doesn't happen, there's no reason to think that they can solve some glassy problem or something that's already difficult. Uh, so, so uh, are, are there generative models that work for wave functions that aren't real and positive? Right. Just the, yes. the RB, okay. So if just the RBMs fail with the non-real, non-positive. So you can just take in a restricted Boltzmann machine and make all the weights complex? That's the simplest one invented by Carleo and Troyer. What we do is we actually take the, w the one we've, the one we use, I, oh yeah, I illustrated here, has an amplitude, which is real, but then we just attach another set of hidden units, which is the phase. So you can just basically double the size of everything, right, you know, two real numbers for a complex number. And so you can learn, you can learn that phase, uh, you know, with additional information and but the point is that the representation of the wave function is, is, is possible even if it's complex. Mm -hmm. So like, when only entropy is much more powerful and spectacular than uh, really entropy. Right. You can actually learn that from really spectacular. No, no magic there. Yeah. You have to essentially have all the rainy entropies, you know, that whole system of linear equations to get out the Eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, and from that you can calculate the von Neumann. But yeah, there's no magic. Yeah, so you have a distribution, right, of configurations. So at, at Boltzmann distribution, that's what it is, right? And, and any configuration that you pull out, uh, well, you know, falls somewhere on that distribution. 
So when that distribution has tails that start to move and you know you start to share configurations, that's why you have a dip here, right? So there's configurations that can land on either side of that of that labeling boundary, of that decision boundary. So essentially these are extended by malware attacks. Like that. So that could go to like web configuration and then drop down and whether it's just extended or not. Yeah, in some sense, you're saying here's a configuration. Is it more likely to uh, occur above or below this threshold? And for some configurations, you know, they, they, they could be equally likely, say. And that's the 50% point here. And that 50% point occurs right at the phase transition. Yeah, we generate all this synthetically, yeah. But then what happens is people map out phase boundaries uh, with these methods, which are kind of a combination of you know, simulation produced data, but then once these neural networks are trained, you can feed in experimental data. So this has been taken to its much more sophisticated, logical sort of conclusion than what we did with the Ising model. Mm -hmm. The question is a sort of first is carefully talking about the annealing. Mm-hmm. And how the current state of what changed. What changed? From what what year, sorry? From when people were talking about annealing models or about the in one thing we did. What year was that, I wonder? Uh, yeah. I don't think anything's fundamentally changed. I mean, people debate this. Is it is it the fact that we have better computers and GPUs and TPUs now, or is it the fact that we have more data, you know, which also involves hard, you know, we have storage facilities and we have network computers that produce more data, uh, or is it algorithms? You know, is it the fact that we've learned to s stack neural networks on top of each other to make them deep? I think it's basically a combination of all three. I don't think there's one, you know, this was sort of a citation for a single paper which people tie to this current uptick in, in interest. But this was just made possible by many things like <coughs> these standardized data sets, you know, these new architectures, which is the, the point of this paper, and the fact that, you know, these things could be trained on the, the CPU resources of the time. So I really don't think that there's any one thing that you know, that changed. It's just sort of, uh, you know, everything that these guys worked on, guys and girls, but a lot of, uh, a lot of these sort of, they call them the godfathers of <laughs> deep learning. What they were working on during these winters, they, they kept doing it and it turned out to work in the end. Artificial neural networks, again, like in the 90s, I would never have went to a talk on them. Of course, I'm trying not to date myself. But, uh, the, you know, the point is that uh, that is the same Technology is, is is responsible for these revolutions now. This uh, you know restricted Bolson machine that I talked about for the generative model. Where is it here? Uh, this thing again, 1982. John Hopfield, a physicist, talking about these things as associative memory. Uh, these papers by Smolinski, Hinton, Yoshua Bengio, and others. Just because I can't pron pronounce that name, uh, you know, this came out in between 82 and 86. Uh, these were you know right before the winter started. But, you know, we look back at these technologies and they're relevant now. We can train these things. Uh, you know, there's obviously other technologies which maybe are more um, uh, powerful. Uh, but there was, there's not one sort of uh, uh, theoretical or hardware-based, you know, advance that, that spurned the stuff. I think it was a combination of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, we we've had this Moore's law increase, which has basically gone unabated. And you know, we train these things on GPUs now. So, you know, GPUs and TPUs. If you have a TensorFlow and you have access to Google's tensor processing units, uh, you know, the amount of carbon released for training one deep learning model is like more than you'll ever use driving your car in your entire life, or something like that. So there is a huge amount of backing of, of, of hardware to training these things. Um, it, I, I think it's also algorithmic, and I think it's the availability of data 
which we, you know, people use to benchmark these algorithms. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so there's like meta machine learning, yeah, right? Machine learning yeah, there's learning, learning op, uh, what do they call them? Uh, learning, learning based optimizers or something, where they, they transfer learn optimizers. So one, idea, you know, one point is like the, the learning rate, you might, just for an example, you might want to change the learning rate as a function of where you are on this funnel, right? And so typically you kind of do that, you know, heuristically or you do it by hand or something like that, but you can also train a neural network to tell you which learning rate to use depending on which step you are in your training. And so, and then you can optimize that neural network to give you the best learning rates. So you can basically do meta. Or you can absorb its own results itself and then we carry out the project. You can do that, yeah. But the point is, can you get good results on untrained models or, and so but what people do is they train those neural networks, they give you learning rate outputs, then they do what's called transfer learning, so they use those on a different problem. So yeah, I mean, any, any sort of meta, machine learning thing you can think of, people are definitely, <laughs> definitely apply. Has there, has there been any, any applications to open oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. There's at least, I'd say, four papers on uh, these types of parameterizations for open quantum systems. Um, I think if you look up Giacomo Torlai, um, who's the first author on a lot of these, he has a nice one uh, for uh, a density matrix, you know, so density matrix parameterization, which will take mixed, mixed states in, uh, and, and which is you know, important for those. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a body of literature now that, that uh, shows you how to do the same generative modeling technique on open systems. Thank you very much. <laughs>